So, I grew up in the United States in a middle class family, and I have two loving and caring parents who have lived their whole life for their children, for their family and close friends, and for their community, and who, by the way, are still married after 55 years. While I was growing up, I held several different jobs, starting with the age of 12, first delivering newspapers. I always had different jobs growing up so that I could earn extra money for spending. And then when I was in university, I needed money so that I could buy my books. One of my most memorable jobs was the summer before I went to university. I was around 17 years old. And I got a job at a supermarket as a bag boy. <laughs> this was when they just started letting girls do this job. And um, they never really got around to changing the name, I guess. So I had three tasks with this job. The first task was bagging groceries for the customers. And this was, remember these brown paper bags? I don't know if any of you are old enough to remember this, but I mean, if you did not pack them right, the customers got really angry. So you had to make sure you didn't smash their produce. And then the second part of my job was around collecting the recycling that the customers would return. Even back in the mid 80s, people were recycling cans and bottles. Although I'm not sure that they really know why they were doing it at the time, but they were imposed a five cent deposit on each of the cans and bottles, so they felt compelled to bring them back to the grocery store. And then the last part of the job entailed collecting carts in the parking lot. And this was sometimes a little bit hazardous because you were dodging cars and you were pushing this really big you know, chain of carts, and people just left them all over the parking lot at that time. They didn't have any of these nice little deposits we have here in Switzerland where the people bring the carts back. So, by the end of the summer, I had a lot of paper cuts on my arms from the bags, and I had dents in my knees from leaning against the bagging shelves, and I had very strong arm muscles, which I was very proud of, by the way. <laughs> but the thing I wanted to tell you about is my discussion that I had with my dad one day on, my way home from, on the way home from work. He always picked me up after I was uh, finished with work. And the discussion was about, it was about a week before I was starting university. And he asked me the normal, how was the job today? But then he went on to say, how did you like working at the summer job at the grocery store? Could you see yourself maybe doing this job again next summer? Or could you see yourself maybe doing this for the rest of your life? And I was like, well, oh, sorry rest of my life, no. I mean, I said, well, Dad, yeah, the people are super nice. I had a lot of fun. But first, I don't think that I'm coming back to do this job again next summer. And I'm definitely not going to do it for the rest of my life. I think I had in the back of my mind at the time that I just wanted to get off to the university because I heard it was really fun when you went there. And I was thinking about really not working at all. <laughs> but what he said to me after that was something that I rem remember so well. I remember it like it was yesterday. He said to me, Robin, I am so happy to hear you say that, because this is why you have these kind of jobs now that you've had over the past years, so you know what you don't want to do for the rest of your life. And he said, that's why you need to go to the university, you need to study hard, you need to study something you love, so that you can, when you finish studying, you can get a good job, and you can earn money that you can kind of survive for the rest of your life. I think this was also his way of telling me that he didn't want me living in his house until I was 30. <laughs> so this for me was a little bit of one of those light bulb moments. I thought back and I said, yeah, you know, I really, really need to, to focus now and I need to um, do something. And my parents were investing a lot of money and for them this was a lot of money and I was very respectful of this because they, uh, I didn't want to waste their money, and I knew that I was going to have to work hard. So I found myself at a, self at a crossroad. So why did I tell you this story? Because I want to talk to you about the risks of short-termism. And you might think that what I'm going to ask is a little bit futuristic, 
It might be a little bit disruptive for you. But I think that as we live in a world that is revolving around instant gratification and short-termism, we need to shift our focus a little bit more to be focused on long-term value creation. And short-termism is a phenomena where we just focus on short-term gains. And this is usually at the risk of long-term success or stability. And what we're seeing in the business world today is that companies are so fearful of, pre of presenting poor quarterly results that they're taking measures which are, for example, um, prolonging investments in people and prolonging investments in, in um, innovation so that they can show their short-term gains to their shareholders. And we all know that this is not good for the business itself and it's not good for the economy as a whole in the long term. So what's driving short-termism? We have something that we call the trust deficit. And this is the trust gap that we're seeing between businesses and um, the, the investors and the community. And the Edelman 2018 trust barometer has determined, based on their survey, that 50% of the people no longer trust business. And they've also, they've also found that 60% of, or that 44% of the people believe that CEOs are credible, while 60% believe that CEOs are driven by greed and not a desire to make a long -term, uh, their long-term value for the economy. The second um, driver we see is around big data. Did you know that 90% of the data that we have today in the world was generated over the last two years? And this is, going, this is increasing incrementally yearly. And this is making it very difficult for companies to control what investors are thinking and what investors are, are what investing in in terms of companies. And what we, are, what we are seeing here is that investors are actually looking at things on the internet um, that are publicly available, like they're looking at employee reviews on uh, platforms where they're describing what they think about the companies they work for. And there's even uh, uh, an analysis of the voice patterns of the um, management teams who are presenting quarterly results to determine if they're maybe even potentially lying. And then we have the changing shape of value. And what this is is where companies um, are reporting globally on a framework, accounting frameworks that were generally basically developed in the 1970s. And in a manufacturing-based economy that's very um, tangible, asset heavy, this makes a lot of sense. But as we we've come into this digital era where companies are more focused on services and development of IP and innovation, does this still make sense? A great example of this, we have that 50% of the company's value today is actually shown in the um, balance sheet of the company. And actually, if you're an S&P 500 company, it's less than 20%. A great example is Airbnb. Everybody knows Airbnb. This is larger than any hotel chain in the whole world, but they don't own a single hotel. And our favorite taxi company, Uber, they don't own a single taxi cab. And then we have the investment disconnect. And the investment disconnect is the pressure on the investment chain to deliver short-term results despite the desire for long-term value creation. And what we're seeing here is that companies do not have the right tools to tell the story of how they create long-term value. How many of you have heard about the Embankment Project for Inclusive Capitalism? Oh, cool. <laughs> so the Embankment Project for Inclusive Capitalism, they uh, presented a report in, in mid-November uh, mid just a few weeks ago. And this was a market-led um, multi-stakeholder initiative to determine, um, to come up with a new measure of success. And the, the um, initiative was led by companies, asset managers, and asset owners. 
and it was um, driven by 30 global business leaders representing $30 trillion of assets under management and 2, 2 million employees around the world. And the outcome of this report was an open source framework to identify and measure intangible assets with an initial set of output metrics that could be used by companies to help them explain how they, how they derive and deliver long-term value. And included in this, with respect to the metrics, was uh, intangible asset that they could drive around, ta around talent. This was very specific to the employee culture and the employee health. And metrics could include like diversity of leadership or how, um, how the um, employee engagement scores are within the, within the company. Innovation. Innovation is about how the companies are meeting, uh, how they're fulfilling unmet needs of customers and societies, focusing specifically on the customer trust and the customer health. The third one is, a new, is not a new one. We all know about envi the environmental impacts and the society impacts. So how are companies engaging purposefully with their communities, and how are they making the least impact on, society, on their environment and society, they want to, they, and how they're actually um, uh, creating jobs as well. And finally, we have the intangible around corporate governance. And in corporate governance, it's really about the board of directors. What is their skill set? and how are they supporting the company to deliver their strategy in the long term. So as you can see, um, this is not holistically complete. We need all the buy-in of all the parties, and we need some really brave companies to start using these metrics and developing these metrics. Um, and so we really now find ourselves here at a business crossroads. And there's no simple solution. But I think we need to swing the pendulum back a little bit to the middle. <clears throat> Excuse me. Because we, we know that in the, if we swing the pendulum back to the middle, we can focus more on the long-term value that the companies are um, driving together with the short-term results. So if I reflect back on the um, investment that my parents made in my education and the hard work and uh, long, lifelong learning that I've made up until this point, uh, the, long, the, the value has actually proven. And that's why I'm able to stand here before you tonight. So again, <laughs> I, when I, back when I was 17, I could have taken the short-term approach. I could have stayed at the grocery store working. Maybe I could have become the manager. But I think that I took the right road. In, the, in hindsight, I think I took the right road. And so what I want to say is that short-termism and instant gratification are not, achieve, are not sustainable without a balanced view of the long term. And as such, I would like to just say that it's not just about showing up, it's also about staying. Thank you very much.